this class. Pray for Brandon as he brings the word of God. And let's pray that we can, when we hear the word, we can take it and apply it to our life. And not just that, but take it out into the world and win lost souls for thee. Now our next class, our ne uh, next speaker, next after Brandon will be Jim Belcher. He'll be talking about judging. So please uh, plan to come and be with us be back with us for the next classes. All right. There's all right. Also, we are going to be having a the Big Break Church of Christ will be having a Thanksgiving service on November the 28th from 9 to 10:30 a.m. So please can it all try to go and be a part of that if you can. If there's nothing else, I'm going to ask for Robert Wright. Maple Grove Church of Christ, if you'll open us up with a word of prayer, pray for our class, pray for Brother Brandon. If you would have bowed with me, our most precious Heavenly Father, we want to first of all thank you for this another day of life. I want to thank you for all the many blessings of life, realizing each and every perfect gift comes down from above. Father, tonight, as John has always said, we pray for our study. pray for those that's been mentioned already. Most of all, Father, we pray for those that out, are outside that great ark of safety. As John's already said, we, we pray that we may do or say something to cause them to realize their need to change before it's their life's too late. And Father, tonight we have to forgive us of our mistakes and our shortcomings. Be with us as we go through this study. It's in your son's holy sweet name we pray. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Glad to be here with you tonight and uh, have our study. Uh, what we're going to be discussing and talking about tonight is uh, the politically incorrect evangelist, Jesus Christ. Our theme this semester is wrapped around the politically incorrect. But before we get into our lesson tonight, let me make some announcements. Uh, we have an uh, outline sheet, note sheet up front. If anyone does not have those sheets, uh, we have plenty. Take one of those. And also, um, I have some information up here as well uh, with the Grundy Bible Institute. And some of you already may know, uh, we have partnered with the Sunshine School of Evangelism. And beginning January, uh, we will be a satellite extension campus of the Sunshine School of Evangelism. And we'll be offering an associate's degree in biblical studies. And so here's an opportunity in southwest Virginia uh, to continue to advance the kingdom, to train men and women. We're just not limiting uh, this Bible college to men. We need more women who can study, who can teach other women and children. Where our brotherhood is lacking today is women teaching other women. And so grab some information. We have an application up here. If you have any information about that, any questions, see me afterwards. And we also have a wide variety of commentaries, uh, topical books, uh, study books in the GBI bookstore from the Sunshine School of Evangelism. If you're interested, see me, and we'll get you in there and let you check those out. Maybe you're interested in checking something out. Alrighty, 
Let's go ahead and get into our lesson. This is not your average uh, uh, lesson that you see where you're looking at scripture, examining a book or a chapter or verse and talking about it. Um, looking at the politically incorrect realm and what we'll be discussing tonight, uh, we're going to have you guys be involved in this lesson as well. Uh, that's how we're going to learn tonight. That's how we're going to discuss uh, the politically incorrect. And we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ tonight, more specific in his teachings. But when you look at and talk about and examine and think about the politically correct uh, realm of thinking and what we see in our culture and society, uh, there's a lot of commentary and public debate over this issue of politically uh, correctness. Everyone seems to have an opinion about politically correctness. Or it's been a, or someone has been affected by the top of the issue, uh, the ideology of politically of being politically correct. It's a growing influence in our society. And uh, we are blind if we can't see the growing influence of politically correctness in our society, in our culture, and even in the church. Politically correct. But in order to not to, to uh, provide a uh, Christian perspective on this ideology, uh, we're going to look at a brief history of politically correctness, where that came from. Uh, we're going to talk about Jesus, uh, his teachings, uh, being a politically incorrect evangelist that he is, and uh, we're going to apply these idea ideas to some scripture and how it affects our society and our culture and even the church. But in today's increasingly sec secular society where diversity, tolerance, and politically correct concepts are the driving motive of the culture, many seem not to exalt Jesus anymore, to lift his teachings up, but what has been idea in the politically correct thinking is we have condensed Jesus and his teachings in a more up-to-date definition, in a more tolerant idea of who Jesus is. And, uh, and what politically correctness teaches us or tells us or demands us is we are to have a more open-minded approach when it comes to the doctrine, when it comes to the church, and when it comes to the Word of God. We're, we're to have a more open-minded approach, not to be so narrow-minded about things. But when we think about Jesus and his teachings, the teachings of Jesus, Jesus was not open-minded. Uh, John 14, 6. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's not a very open-minded statement. When Jesus says that he's the truth, this flies in the face of political correctness. And what many have done, even amongst Christians, what many have done with Jesus is Jesus has been redefined, his teachings has been redefined into Jesus just being a nice guy. See, Jesus was kind, but he wasn't nice. You don't crucify nice people. You don't do it. And so what, what we've seen, what has been created in the politically correct realm of thinking, is Jesus is the Mr. Rogers of Nazareth. He's your friendly neighborhood friend. He wants to be your buddy. And this is what has been created in the mindset of many, and much of what Jesus has taught in his teachings, in the word of God, clashes with how our culture and even how the church redefines the person and the teachings of Jesus Christ. But before we look at issues in our culture and put these issues in comparison, we're going to talk about uh, three different issues that we see within our culture. And you see those in your outline. We're going to talk about the cultural war of politics, the indigestion of acceptance. You know, acceptance is a big thing now, right? We'll look at that, and then you look at your third point, we'll be talking about uh, bringing all this together tonight, uh, and talking about different issues, and the shape of sin and diversity. Uh, but before we get into our first uh, issue, let me ask the question, and I want you to answer, see where your mindset is, uh, what is political correctness, and what is Politically incorrect. Somebody throw it out there. Don't be shy. That's um, now about every show, every TV show you see, it's um, Happy Holidays. Happy Holidays. Okay. Now, it's Merry Christmas. 
Okay. 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 Holiday. You got you. It, 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 it probably a holiday, but it Merry Christmas. Okay. But they would rather die than to say Merry Christmas. Okay. Don't want to offend nobody. Right. So Happy it's about holidays. Happy holidays. So it's about uh, offending someone, renaming yeah. things. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other ideas of the difference between being politically correct and being politically incorrect? They don't care about offending me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You see that influence of our government, uh, you know, Christian universities, Christian colleges turn to universities. When when universities start taking money from the government, then guess who gets to say so and correct it? The government does, doesn't it? And so now we see it's very prevalent to teach evolution in our uh, in our schools, not just colleges, but you know, grade schools and high schools. Uh, you know, any other ideas, thoughts? All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of political correctness, the movement. I'm not going to get in a very deep history lesson here. Um, but it, it, the politically correct movement, it, it's not a new movement or not a new idea. It's been around, well, it's been around, you'll see it in the scriptures as we talk about it tonight. But um, really it began in Europe in the 1920s and it opposed the working class against uh, the ruling class and the government of the time in the 1920s in Europe. And the true intent of this movement was to create a us versus them mentality. That, that was what the whole movement was. So what would happen is we would have put the rich against the poor. We'll put man against woman, right? Or we'll put uh, the victim against the bully. It's an us versus them mentality. That's what the whole politically incorrect movement is. The movement made its way in the Cold War during the Soviet Union you see that big movement when the Berlin Wall fell, you know, that disappeared. But we see a movement in China amongst the communists. It's a big movement there. And eventually it's made its way in America in the 1960s, the hippie movement, I guess you could say, uh, the Woodstock movement. But it's all about civil rights, equal rights, equal rights, me, me, me. It's all about my rights. And it's, just, it's prevalent today. It has grown so much today that the movement's made its way inside the church. But ultimately, what politically correctness does or demands us, it tells us to commit logical suicide. To think or to do something without any logic. That's what the politically correct movement really bases itself around today. And what politically correctness wants to do is buy into a more up-to-date definition, as I said earlier, of who Jesus is and what his teachings is. It's, it's out of date, the Bible is. The teachings of Jesus. Right? And so homosexuality is more acceptable in the church. Fornication, right? Out of wedlock. That is even more acceptable than homosexuality. Right? And so we see things that are becoming more tolerant, more acceptable inside the church because of this movement that made its way in America. And so instead of the world conforming to the teachings of the God, the church has conformed to the teachings of the world. Right. Right? And we've accepted that. And we've been, become okay with that. But the first point I want to talk about tonight in the politically correct realm of thinking, we can, th we can talk and talk about so many different issues that are re relevant today, but the first one I want to talk about is the cultural war of politics. And we're going to talk about this. But, you know, what this war has done, the cultural war of politics, it has brought Americans against each other. It's a civil war. And it is sadly also brought the church against each other. It's a war based upon ideology. It's what the war is. An ideology. A system of ideas, beliefs, or opinions that characterize the culture. So, you know, our culture is char characterized by capitalism, <coughs> communism, socialism, Democrat, Republican, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. I mean, those system of beliefs, that's what characterizes our culture. So in our culture, the enemy is defined by a political party or someone's position on a uh, certain issue. And we see a similar war that's happening inside the church as well. Traditional versus contemporary music. 
Instrumental versus non-instrumental music. <coughs> Traditions versus ideas. Wood carpet versus hardwood floor. 72 degrees versus 68 degrees of non-toilet. All right? Uh, it, it has become a war. And brothers or sisters are fighting over nonsense. So the war of politics that's blend right inside the church and it has caused many problems and many church splits. And we think it's okay, well, we'll just go somewhere else and we'll start another church. Right? We'll start another problem. That's pretty much what it is. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. So the culture of war, it's more about power and security. That's what the culture war is about. And Jesus had a lot to say about both of these issues, about power and security. In Jesus' time, in biblical times, you had the Jews against the Romans. Yet in this cultural war of the time, that still wasn't Jesus' concern, the Jews against the Romans. You had Herod and Pilate. They played the politically correct game all too well. Uh, the Pharisees wanted to remain in power over the people by setting the Romans up. And Pilate blamed everything bad that was happening on the Jewish leaders who couldn't control the people. You see, in the politically correct movement, there always has to be an enemy. We're always pointing fingers at somebody. It's somebody else's fault. That's what goes on in, in the cultural war. But Jesus stopped, stepped into the midst of the first century cultural war with a totally new way of thinking. There were two main groups who wanted to kill Jesus, the Jews and the Romans. You see, Jews wanted to kill Jesus because they didn't believe that he was truly the Son of God. Jesus came, said he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and they called him and said he was blasphemy. You know, he was blaspheming, according to them, according to their beliefs. And they expect, what they expected this Jesus to do is to come, overthrow the Roman government, and bring the, bring the Jewish nation back up. Because, hey, we Jews, we the bomb, right? That's what they thought. And the Pharisees wanted Jesus dead because uh, Jesus was changing things, a new way of thinking. They set out to memorize these rules and these laws, the things that they had grown up knowing. I mean, they had grown up knowing rules and laws. They, they had memorized uh, the Torah. They knew the, raw, the law like the back of their hand. And Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. Right. Now, he, he came to set things in a totally different way of thinking. So for the Pharisees, what that meant, everything that they worked for their entire lives, Jesus was coming to get rid of. A whole new way of thinking. And the Romans, well, they didn't like Jesus. They wanted Jesus killed because they believed that Jesus was creating an uprising amongst the Jews. And they didn't really care about the Jewish beliefs, about him being God, but they knew that Jews did not agree with the Roman government. So for very different reasons, the Romans and the Jews both set out to kill Jesus. What Jesus is doing today in our culture is the same he has done amongst the Jews and the Romans. See, Jesus was a threat to both the Jews and the Romans, and he's a threat to both the Democrat and the Republican today. He's a threat to both the conservative and the liberal today. And what we have done is we think, well, it's my way. I'm conservative, a bunch of liberals, right? We think, well, it's my way. Or the liberals say, well, they're just too conservative, too narrow mind. They don't know what they're talking about. And Jesus steps right in the boundary of both of them and says, it's not your way, it's not your way, it's my way. Okay? And so that's what we see. And he's a threat to both groups. And Jesus st stood for something in the culture. What has happened is we've confused ourselves into thinking that Jesus is taking my side. It's my way. And we've and what has happened in the church is it's an us versus them mentality. It goes right back, full circle, politically, politically correct. So the problem we see today within our culture is those who are waging war have convinced many who claim to be Christians to somehow get the government to be on their side. This is what we see today amongst Christians. That the government is the savior of the world. And what has happened is we've replaced one savior with another savior. The American society. The political process. And this same process is within the church and within the congregations today. 
multiple sides within the congregation, pick sides, have cliques. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to get the preacher on their side. Huh? Let's, let's, let's get the preacher on my side. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 32. Now I know you guys say, well, I didn't know Brandon's ever going to get any scripture. Or not. <laughs> John chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to my, men to myself. Jesus didn't say if his word was lifted up. He didn't say if your choice of political party was lifted up. He didn't say if the traditions of the church are lifted up. Jesus wanted his followers to lift him up and nothing else. Jesus is not concerned with our agendas. He has no affiliation and he will not be bought with the ideas of man. So we can change doctrine, we can change theology, we can change politics, we can change whatever we want, but at the end of the day, Jesus will not be bought with what we change. So what we must understand now is that the hill that Jesus died on at Calvary is not Capitol Hill. He didn't die on Capitol Hill. He died on Calvary. And we need to hang on to that and remember that. Because when we raise the flag higher than the cross, we have a problem. When we raise our agendas, our ideas above the cross, above Jesus and his teachings, we have a very serious problem then. And we're okay with that. But if we want to fight the culture of war, if we want to debate who's right or who's wrong, we don't need to use Jesus, and we don't need to use his word to debate. We need to lift Jesus and his word out of debate when it comes to politics or ideas or thoughts or how you feel or how I feel. We need to leave that Jesus and his word out of it. Because when we start putting Jesus in debating and arguing and fighting, people are going to become confused of really what the gospel of Jesus is really about. And they're going to be bought into an idea of us versus them. They're to, their, their decision on becoming a Christian, they're really not going to be converted, but their decision on wanting to become a Christian is going to be based on who's right or who's wrong. And they're not really converted. They're just converted on an idea, on an ideology. But this is not to say, though, when, with all this being said, this is not to say that we shouldn't pray for our nation. We shouldn't be concerned with our leaders. That's not, I'm not saying that. We need more of a godly influence when it comes to these issues. But let us not confuse who Jesus is. The Apostle Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, he said to pray for those in authority. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions... Prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We need to pray for our leaders, for our nation, and everything that goes on in the political realm of, of, of things. So, the next question, discussional question, I want to take a break, a discussional question. I like to take a little bit of a break because I don't want to do all the talking and, and drag you guys on. I want to see where you guys are at. So what can be dangerous with the culture of war we face within the church? Now, we see the culture of war we face in our society and culture. And that's a dangerous thing already. We see it. It's destroying our nation. But more dangerous than that is a culture of war that we face within the church. What's dangerous about that? Somebody share your thoughts. The vision. The vision, right. Yeah. The vision destroyed the church. Yeah. And it, it will cause, well, Grundy sadly has had its share of division. The They've seen what has happened. I'm sure some other congregations will. Yeah. Even small congregations. Right. The Big Range Church back in the 1940s was split. Yeah. Christians have done is they fa 
All right, he's trapped. He's waiting. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Leave the Lord and his words. Leave him out of the debate. Those are the words I remember. I was thinking about one of the politicians on TV, they were talking about raising taxes. Mm -hmm. And so, well, we need to raise more taxes and we need to give to the poor people and everything. And then then the second was, well, that's what Jesus would want us to do. Mm -hmm. That's not what Jesus would want us to do. Excellent. Jesus wants me. To give something to somebody that needs it. Right. right. He don't want the government to or take it away from mm -hmm. me to give it to somebody. He wants me to give it to somebody because I want to right. and because that he wants me to. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, you know, he, he never, Jesus never once said, I want you to give all your stuff to the government so they can distribute it. And I've always said, if the church today would do what Jesus said for us to do. We wouldn't need welfare. We wouldn't need social security. We wouldn't need food banks. Exactly. We wouldn't need all these things because we'd be taking care of the people. Right. But it comes down to the person. We have to understand in, our, in ourselves that we have to give to the church mm -hmm. so the church can do these things. Yeah. It is important. But, and, and it's also important that the church leaders understand, as Preacher Greenleaf would often say, he said, what they want to do, they get all they can, they can't all they get, they sit on the can. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. that, that's, that's not the reason that people tithe to the church. It's right. to do yeah. what the Lord wants us to do. Mm -hmm. So when the church uses the funds of the church to take care of that poor family, or that you know, if, if each one of us, if each congregation would understand that, you know, we could really make a big difference not only in people's lives, but in the world, and not only that, but to let people see what Christ is really, yeah. what he's really about. Yeah. That he wasn't just a glorified politician, mm -hmm. but he is the son of God, and he's the son of God. Yeah, yeah, great point, Stan. And, you know, we see, you know, culture war, you know, it does cause division. It will destroy a church, and, you know, with the with the thoughts that Stan and Sherry, you know, um, when we feel like everything is ours in the church, it really becomes an us versus them because when we distribute the Lord's blessings, what do we base it on? Who we like and who we don't like. Right. Who, 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 think, who we think is deserving of it is what we base it upon. Right? I've often said we would do something for somebody and they say, well, somebody might even make a comment, well, I don't know if they really need it. I said, well, we did the right thing. Yeah. Whether they did the right thing. So, and really what it comes down to with the culture war we face within the church is really uh, taking in account as a whole, as the body of Christ, with what we do according to God's oh, word. Right. Uh, when, we, when our motive of our agenda is when we disagree with something or when we think something's our way, we'll take scripture out of context and try to make it fit with what I think needs to be done. You can't do that. That's the reason we need to leave Jesus and his word out of it. Because, you know, I'm not picking on the elders or leadership or anything like that or even preachers, but you see a lot of the church leaders, they will use scripture for their own agenda. Mm -hmm. right. Satan used scripture for his own agenda. And he, he, did. Did. And he did. He did. He, he will too. So, uh, great points. Good. Good. To say. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Hey. Oh, sorry, brother. Go ahead. I just think about what Brother Stan was saying there. And wasn't that the way it was when the church first started? They uh, gathered money wherever they went, took it to help those that needed help there in Jerusalem? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, even then, when the church first founded, and Brother Max tells us, they even sold their property, their possessions, right? yeah. mm -hmm. to give to those that, that were in need. Yeah. They sold their property, sold their possessions. 
Kim Ann announced the Safari Conference. They decided to block that. They didn't work out too good for them. They didn't work out. Yeah. yeah. Let's keep it for myself. How about that? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about our second point tonight. And uh, I named these kind of comical, thinking different topics, issues, but, you know, the indigestion of acceptance. And we really digested acceptance to the point where it just don't digest very well. Acceptance, acceptance, when it comes to scripturally speaking and biblically speaking, it doesn't digest all too well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But if you take the concept of political correctness at face value, I mean, it's a good thing when you think about it. Um, if being politically cor correct means to treat people of different backgrounds with respect, not to stereotype a man by by or a man or a woman because of their gender or uh, of their race. I mean that's a biblically biblically correct concept, not to stereotype. But that's not politically correctness. And the real the real tension of the politically correct movement, well, it's a uh, more of a, a demand. Uh, it's to imitate intimidate people than their progressive ideas. It's an intimidation. I mean, we're living in an age of political correctness that goes far beyond being kind and thoughtful. The political correct movement will say, well, we need to be nice and more acceptable and more tolerant of people. But what happens when you're not tolerant of, or acceptable with what their movement's about? They're very aggressive. They're out to seek and find you. And today's rules demand that we do our very best to never say anything that might possibly offend someone. That's what we see in here today. And the result of this is people are walking on pins and needles because of this. Even preachers and, and elders are walking on pins and needles because God forbid if we offend someone who gives money to the church. I mean, I don't know how the church is going to survive staying without money. Well, the church can go on without money. Amen. <laughs> but you know, we're, we're intimidated. Yeah, yeah. And he's never let me down one bit, Rusty. He does provide, no matter your circumstance. Um, but, you know, people will walk on pins and needles, and they will sacrifice truth and common sense for popular opinion. They'll sacrifice it. So the struggle... It's not believing in God. It's not believing who Jesus is. The struggle that we see in our society today is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in a culture that attacks your beliefs. And they don't even attack, just attack your beliefs. They will attack your character. Yeah. They will do, your, do their best to attack, attack your reputation. So, but sadly, the attack is not just from the world. It's in the church. The same attack. Acceptance in the church has gone as far as accepting sin, tolerating corruption, and even tolerating false teaching. Yeah, watered down religion. Watered down religion. That's exactly what it is. And the church is afraid because of that. I mean, we hide, the church hides in the shadows of cultural contempt. And what our culture has done is it has shifted to the point where bad is good and good is bad. And it's also shifted to the point in the church that the only wrong is saying something is wrong. That's what, that's the mindset of today. And if we disagree with moral decisions, what are we considered? Racist? Antagonists? Intolerant? Bigots? And if we disagree with the religious, what are we considered? Holier than thou? You're the only one's going to heaven? You think you're better than me? You see, everyone wants to be accepted even if that means you compromise the truth. And that's what they want. In the times of Jesus, there were three groups of religious fanatics. You have the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. The Zealots, in the first century, they encouraged violence against the Roman Empire. They were called the freedom fighters, if you will. And they were always out to attack the Romans. And Jesus, but Jesus, what did he do? He opposed violence. He opposed that type of conflict. And he still preached love. The Sadducees saw Jesus as a religious fanatic. And the Pharisees saw Jesus making, Je Jesus making them look bad because of what he has to say. He's making us look bad in front of the leaders in Rome. 
See, Jesus lived in a time, we see in the scriptures, where the religious and the politicians were looking to be accepted amongst the crowd. And Jesus didn't tolerate any of these groups, the religious or the politicians. Jesus loved people, but he never tolerated or accepted their sin. And a good example, we're going to look at a scripture. John chapter 8, the first 11 verses. We're not going to go through all first 11 verses, but would somebody read uh, those 11 verses for me? Don't be shy. Okay. Jesus went into, into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and talked to him. Scribes and Pharisees come to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what says thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have, have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted of their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even up to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, saw none, but the woman he said unto her, Woman, where are those that accuse her? Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. It's interesting in this account of the Pharisees uh, being the religious nuts that they were. They didn't care one iota about this woman's sin. They didn't care about what she did. They wasn't concerned about her. What was the whole point of, of, of uh, bringing this woman to Jesus? Yeah, trying to catch Jesus to say something. It goes back to that us versus them mentality. And with that mentality, we need to find an enemy. We need to find somebody to oppose against somebody else. And so what the, the woman caught in adultery was, she was just a pawn in the game of the Pharisees. And she was just uh, used and abused. But when the woman was brought before Jesus, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when he was brought before that? The first, he, 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 stuck, he got down and wrote, wrote his finger in the sand, didn't he? And he wrote on the ground with his finger and he made a statement that drove the accusers away. He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. But that's a good question. Um, me and Rusty had actually talked about some of that the other night. Um, we, you know, don't know, and you know, it could be the woman's sins. It could have been the Pharisee's sins. It could have been the Ten Commandments. It could have been, you know, I mean, you just think and think and think. I mean, it's really neat. I think what Jesus done is to teach us all the lesson that we yeah. that we need. Yes. Before you open your mouth. Just a minute. Hey, think about what you want to say. Right on the ground. Right on the ground. Yeah. 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 But you know, you know what? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 You know what's interesting with Jesus riding in the sand? The same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments was the same finger that wrote the sand. And it's going to be the same finger that says, away from me. And that's, a, that's something serious that we need to take into consideration. Especially when we open our mouth when we shouldn't. You know, we, we need to take things into consideration. Um, Jesus had the right to condemn this lady. I mean, he had the right to even convict this lady. To, to an eternal sentence. He had that power and that right. Well, I know you, maybe he, he wrote for his. He yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he 
could have wrote forgiveness into the sand. We think about that. But after, after the accusers left, Jesus made a simple but a powerful statement that changed this woman's life in verse 11. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, he didn't just leave it, neither do I condemn you and put a period there. And just leave it. He said, go and sin no more. You see, our lines in the sand that we draw, it must be, they must be quiet. We must be quiet through them. We draw our lines in the sand. So that Christ's love is always more evident to the world. They need to see your love and not what we always got to say sometimes. Go ahead, brother. Uh, I was just thinking, brother, uh, for myself, before I accuse someone of mm -hmm. something, I should look at my own life. Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, see the sin in my life before I start accusing yeah. someone else. Yeah, I believe Jesus talked about a speck in the eye, a piece, big old piece of lumber. You know? He kind of made, talks a little bit about that. But, you know, uh, when we talk, take this in consideration, just this account, and I want to ask the question, how does tolerance affect our culture and the church today? You know, Jesus didn't condemn the lady, but he also wasn't tolerant right. with the lady. He didn't tolerate her sin. Um, but, with that being said, how does tolerance affect the culture and our church and the church today? Well, you know, most churches just all Yeah, 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 just, you know, and, you know, you, you, you hear, I, I've heard this, we've all heard it, maybe some of us said it, we say, well, the church is a hospital, not a club. Yeah. Wait, the thing with the hospital is they're always sick people, right. they're never healed. Right. Yeah. If we don't have healed people in the church, then what, what Jesus died for? Right. He's healed us from sin. Amen. He's cleansed us from sin. Right. Right. We need, and we're not a club either. You know, but, but uh, you know, good point. You know, what anybody else got any thoughts? How does tolerance affect the culture in the church? Well, the church has got to have forgiveness as well, right? Yeah, so, you know, yeah. everybody's got if you look at that person as a sinner, mm -hmm. if you don't forgive, you're just as much a sinner as they are, right? Yeah, and 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 that that's the, that's the line that that's drawn in hypothetically speaking, the line drawn in the sand. Forgiveness and tolerance, you know. Where's the line drawn at there? Uh, which, you know, it's a good, good point, uh, Robin. Let me bring that out. Um, any other ideas, comments? The word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in that culture uh, during that time. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, in that time, one commit adultery, you're going to be stoned, stoned to death, right? Now, if we commit adultery in the church today, well, you know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, and it's not because uh, we're going to have uh, much more, uh, um, more punishment than being stoned to death in eternal damnation. Now, you know, we are to forgive, of course. That's when we need to. That's when we need to shut our mouth sometimes, probably, and to say, "We love you." Let us help you. And, and, and. Then, but then also, uh, we have to understand that the forgiveness is always dependent upon repentance. Exactly. I mean, you know, we can't be expected to forgive someone, I don't think, uh, of a sin if we're going to continually do that. So we can't be accepted of it. We, we have, if we're going to continue to do that, we can't accept it. Mm -hmm. and, even Jesus, he, he went to me, he said, well, unless you repent, you shall all my perish. Mm -hmm. So we have to have that attitude of repentance before he can even consider 
and, and when we be, when when that becomes tolerant, that you know, when that becomes acceptable, that hey, it, it's okay. Time to get me my list. <laughs> um, when that becomes accepted, then you know, we begin to change the way the church functions and the way the way that the church is set up. Um, you know, a good example you you put people behind pulpit that don't need to be behind that, or you put men in in the eldership that really just shouldn't be in that. And yeah, yeah, exactly, serving the Lord. I mean, sinners. Those who are in, living in sin, serving the Lord. So that's a serious problem. It is. And, and we think that, well, we don't have enough people to do it, Stan. We, I'll do it by myself. Yeah. Well, I'd rather have a faithful woman serve the Lord's Supper than, a, than a, someone who uh, live in a heathen life. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that's serious. And we need, to, we need to strongly oppose disobedience to God, but also show them love and forgiveness right. in their repentance. In the repentance. Yeah. And it continues to show them love. We need to, you know, encourage them and hold them accountable. And I think that's one thing we need to do in our forgiveness is hold each other accountable. Because, you know, uh, I want my brother Rusty to make sure I don't do nothing stupid. That's <laughs> true. You know, in the same way, you know, like with our with our elders, we need to hold our elders accountable, and our elders need to hold our evangelists accountable. We need to hold everybody accountable. Well, the end of the saying, man, saying what you're saying there, that's not something that. No. We leave, if you love each other, you're going to put your arm around each other mm -hmm. and you're going to yeah. talk to each other. And you're going to, when you've got struggles and weaknesses and temptations in your life, you need an accountability partner. Somebody you say hello to and confide in and, mm -hmm. and let people know I'm struggling with this. I need to talk to someone and I need prayer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, but when the church becomes tolerant of the culture and the lifestyles of individuals, um, then what, what's driven is pleasure and, and uh, pleasing others. That's, that's the driving motives. Uh, picking and choosing what's culturally accepted is not the answer. And what is culturally accepted in the church is someone living in their sin, whether they're okay or not. And we should be concerned about them. We should love them enough to be concerned for their soul. Um, You're talking about members of the church, not just people at Talking about Christians. Yeah. Let me say yeah, I think, you know, as a member, what I found out, Brother Jim, if you're giving out anything free, everybody's a member of the church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Christian, yeah. You know. We do want sinners to come so we can teach them and so we can preach yeah. them. Right. So we don't accept them yeah. without teaching them. Yeah, which exactly. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and instead of, really, though, instead of we expecting sinners to come into church, the church should be going to the sinners. Yeah. Them. But you know that that that's doesn't happen all the time. But we need to let them know you know what what goes on. You know, Brandon, you were talking to earlier about um, the the don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to lose the family because you know that they may give offering or their tithes and come to the church. But really, when you think about it, what does all that matter when you're standing on the day of judgment? I mean, if you're tolerant in this world. On the day of judgment, God's going to look at them and say, depart. What good was it for mm -hmm. you to be tolerant with them? Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. by you being tolerant, you're not teaching them, and they're going to spend eternity in hell. Yeah, and what, what we've done with tolerance is, if there's there's no right or wrong in, in the tolerant world, and if there's no right or wrong, then everyone's opinion is true and valuable uh, no matter who you are. And that's the same thing with the religious world. All roads lead to heaven. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all going to go to heaven again. Yeah, yeah. We're all going yeah. to heaven again. Yeah, we're all going yeah. to heaven so, yeah. Somebody has to be wrong in every situation, whether it's in society and culture or whether it's in the church. Well, Not at, everybody. Least, at least one has to be wrong. At least one has to be wrong. Yeah, be, yeah, be wrong. Now, if, if you got instruments, you're definitely wrong, bro. Tell me a degree.
understand them all. Yeah. If they got the boldness to stand up for what's right. I mean, I'm not down to no elders, but I ain't going down bad at Yeah. Well, I tell you this, Brother Greg, and I'm sure a lot of these preachers. They tolerate the wrong stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's a lonely road when you're standing on the gospel. Amen. It's a lonely road. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I mean, all the way back to his book, he was back to a lot. He thought he was all alone. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. The press, yes. Yeah, and, and it, it's difficult. God it, shows it, it, got more just like it. Yeah. When you're in the ministry, when you're in the church, and you're concerned with spiritual things, it's a lonely road. It is. Um, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, right here. Play a little violin. That's, that's what I got. Yeah. 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 Well, su- suck it up, Buttercup, is what we got to do. <laughs> but but what, what we've done with no right or wrong is we've turned the lights off slowly with that. Uh, and it, it, it's gotten dark, and political correctness wants to keep us in the dark. That's what political correctness does us do. But once we eliminate the notion of what's good or bad, right or wrong, it's a slippery, slippery, slippery slope of what people will tolerate. And believe me, people will tolerate about anything. And they're okay with it. So what we've done as a society is we have ingested so much acceptance that it has caused us to compromise absolute truth. That's called secular humanism? Yeah, secular humanism, exactly what it is. Yep. And uh, and in this indigestion, we've really made a mess of ourselves, haven't we? Oh. A big old mess. Um, I'm going to ask another question. I like you guys interacting. Uh, what do we see has become culturally accepted in the church? Now, don't just say sin. <laughs> when, uh, or anything like that. But what do we see that's been seen as more culturally accepted in the church? You've <clears throat> Somehow people take a, uh, yeah, I mean, their own ideology, that's right. and yeah. that's what that is. What's become culturally accepted in yeah. the church yeah. is uh, uh, religious idiots, if you will. That's the nice way to put it. Uh, um, we've just compromised scriptures to fit what we think works best. Well, you know what got me too with that is that Cray Allen during the revival he has said that even atheists knows more about the scriptures than what the they sure do. Are.
bothers me to no end is, uh, of course, people now, they, and I'm, I'm bad for it too, and I always got a cell phone in hand or whatever, but where their cell phone signal, people sitting around the church said, listen to the worship of God, and, yeah. and uh, sitting there while sermon's going on there on base hit, playing a game or whatever, and the way I see that, that's just a complete disrespect for God and His Word. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. He has to do like I did one time. I said, I pray for that because there's a phone in the church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I see one out, I'm about to die. Yeah. He does my phone that way, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> 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 The final one. I don't mind having that, you know, you shows. Right. I was sure, where was that at? And I might see if you can find that, you know, handy dandy thing there, because I forgot where it's at. Yeah. yeah. It does help. Yeah. I don't mind that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about people. So now we're going to transition in our final point, and I kind of the tolerance. We see that there's a shape to tolerance, and the shape we're going to talk about the shape of sin and diversity, and what and there's a transition that we're going to talk about and see in this. Is back a really quick point. But when we, we're going to go back to the garden account in Genesis chapter 3. We're not going to read the whole count of 21 verses. Um, we're going to do a little quick overview. But we're going to see in the garden account how man reacted when he first sinned. And when he first sinned, it tells us a lot. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, I'm just going to read a few, a few uh, scriptures here. But we know in Genesis chapter 3, the account, the serpent, uh, he's in the garden with Adam and Eve. He comes to, uh, to eat. Um, what's he do? He uses God's word to tempt him. Uh, and, uh, you know, Eve falls into temptation. Uh, and then uh, Eve wants to give the fruit to Adam. And he takes a bite of the fruit. And then what happens with all this? Adam blames Eve. Eve blames Satan. Right. Blame, we want to find somebody to blame. Right? And, and that's what we see. But in verse 7 of chapter 3, what's interesting is that uh, we want to see here, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So what's interesting here about Adam and Eve is they, become aware, they became aware of their nakedness after they ate the fruit. It wasn't aware. It's called self-awareness. Um, but what did they do in their self-awareness? They tried to fix themselves, right? They, they gathered what they could find, they sewed fig leaves, and, and tried to manage to cover their nakedness. That's what they tried to do. They tried to fix themselves. When you go in verse 21 of chapter 3, and, and also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So verse 21 says that God found them hiding and made the, their first clothes in a way of covering them. It had nothing to do with them being naked. That wasn't the reason why God covered them. God was covering their shame is what God was covering. God first covered man with the skins of animals. And then he ultimately covered man by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the culture, what the culture has done, is it's been covering its shame for a very long time. Even those who profess to be followers of Christ have been covering their shame. And they think they're okay. And what society has done in the church is it has taken fig leaves, spiritual fig leaves of diversity, and sewed them together in a way that we now tolerate sin and the sin. And that's what we've done. See, Adam and Eve hid from God because of their shame. And it comes full circle today in society that people celebrate shame above virtue. Our society is paying the price and hiding from God. We won't admit it, though, will we? We will cover out ourselves up with work, with busyness, with acceptance, with dishonesty, even success. 
That's what we'll cover ourselves up with. But in, in the end, God will peek through the bushes and he'll look at our fig leaf covers and say, did you think you could hide from me? Hebrews 4.13 And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, the shape of sin has been molded into diversity. Political correctness interprets diversity as justifying behaviors. We, we see that a lot. People justify their sin. Always justifying their behavior. Jesus did not accept justification on our part. You see, the world expects acceptance of different lifestyles. And we celebrate this. Differences are to be celebrated according to the way that the world views diversity. And the social uh, atmosphere, the culture thrives on this idea. TV shows, movies, pop culture. Millions are made on a diverse culture. For example, Pride Month in parades. Celebrate. Children dressing as drag queens. They make TV reality shows of that. And they think that's okay. Uh, teenagers getting pregnant. Celebrate that. Bachelor shows where men and women out of wedlock come together. We celebrate that. And, and there's no shame. Abortion parades and celebrations. I mean, the list can go on and on and on and on with this movement of political correctness. And it forces the idea of diversity and it sells it as a product that many claim they're Christians when they buy into this product. They say the church needs to be more diverse. See, political correctness understands diversity as inclusiveness. Yet Jesus excludes a large crowd from the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Can somebody read that? Jesus excludes a very large crowd from the kingdom of God. Now, we say this today, we, we, we read the scripture today, we'll say, well, you mean judgmental? Uh, uh, you should be more tolerant, is what people say. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. That excludes a very large crowd from the kingdom of God. Jesus was not inclusive to the large crowd. Jesus was anything but inclusive. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who will go in by. Because narrow is the gate. And difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus was not inclusive when it comes to tolerance, acceptance of sin. See, the only thing Jesus was inclusive about was his Father's love for mankind. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But there's the word sin. Diversity has a problem with sin. Because it makes men unclean uh, according to their lifestyle and attitude. See, Jesus does not accept the inclusiveness of diversity when it comes to accepting all lifestyles. And when it comes to all roads lead to heaven, it's not inclusive. So on the last point, finishing up this lesson, I want to make how political correctness affect, affects religion. It's now politically correct to claim that someone may be lost because of sin. That's politically incorrect today. Someone's lost because of sin. And this is because from the politically correct perspective, there's no sin there's no sin of politically correctness. Uh, the results of racism, sexism, oppression, that's not sin. That's what politically correctness teaches. It's also politically incorrect to suggest that one may be lost or misled because of their denomination. 
That's politically incorrect to say that. Because along with universal multiculturalism, there comes, comes the idea of universal salvation. And that's what, that's what uh, is taught today, is anybody can be saved no matter what you believe. As long as you're sincere. There's going to be a lot of sincere people in hell, and I mean that with all sincerity. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. So what the politically correct movement in every religion says is, you know, religion accomplishes man's salvation, not Jesus accomplished man's salvation. That you can save yourself. That man can do whatever he wants. There is a way which seems right to man. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. That's right. So if all religions, if all denominations are of equal value, then none of them are worth anything. And since they teach contradictory things about God and salvation, well, I mean, you can just believe whatever you want. So if you say that there's only one God and one way to salvation, you're branded as uh, religiously intolerant and legalistic. Fanatic. Huh? You're a fanatic. You're a fanatic. Yeah, you're a fanatic. You're a bigot. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 there's no salvation in any other name among men but the name of Jesus Christ. I can't predict the future of the political correct realm of thinking but I can guarantee one thing closing up tonight. That politically correctness cannot and will not prevail, destroy, or control the church. Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Take out the gates of Hades and replace it with a, any attack or movement you want to, depending on the century you live in. Communism will not prevail against it. Socialism will not prevail against it. Materialism will not destroy the church. Political correctness will not destroy it either. If Satan cannot destroy the church, and he can't, we can feel confident tonight as we close out that any movement that comes along, any ideology, any theology that comes along, it cannot and will not destroy the church. But in every generation, there's going to be someone or something that wants to shut us up, Christians, that wants us to stop believing what we believe and try to change our mind. And we see that in the church today. You see, the culture of the church has changed so much. Something so simple as out of wedlock, living together. That was unheard of in the early days of, the, um, in, the, in our culture in America in the, what, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? I mean, that, that was unheard of. But it has become culturally accepted in the church today. And what do we do? We celebrate it. Let's have a baby shower. In the fellowship, I'll be all right. <laughs> I mean, but it's not the baby's fault. Uh, we, we justify sin. That's what we do. We just start justifying. Yeah. If we stand up and are strong in the faith and courageous in love, we will be biblically correct. Yeah. So, in our society and culture, even in the church, when we go outside and go to work tomorrow, let's not be politically correct. Let's be biblical. God bless you guys. Um, I appreciate you uh, going through this. This isn't your typical Bible lesson. I wanted to approach this uh, idea a little bit different. Um, it's a serious topic and a serious issue, and uh, we need to be on our guard uh, what's going on in our culture and society. Not just in our nation. We, we need to take things serious in our nation, but within the church as well. There's a serious problem that's going on within the church. And we need to stop tolerating and accepting sin and help people get out of it. Correct them, love them, forgive them, teach them. The only way they're going to know what to do is if we teach them. So that starts with us, brothers and sisters. God bless each and every one of you. Are there any other uh, comments or any suggestions, anything you want to share tonight uh, before we uh, close out? Joshua Bowles said, If it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But Chaucer said, As for me, my house, my family, my children, we're going to serve the Lord. And it's time for the church.
church of the Lord Jesus Christ to take a stand and become a part of the Joshua generation. Anybody else got any comments? Again, thank you all for being here tonight and those who are watching uh, this video live as Glenn shows you our audience. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. And again, uh, you know, we got our Bible college beginning in January. If you know any men or women who are interested in this, listen, I wish that I had the opportunity to take advantage of what we're going to do here. It would have cost me a lot, a lot less than what I paid for college. Uh, but let me share with you what we're going to do real quickly, and then I'll have Brother Rusty uh, pray for uh, our dismissal and our uh, snacks. Um, it's really simple set up. Uh, the class, it's a two-year program, but we begin in January and we finish in May. We do that the first year and the second year. It's just a spring semester each year. And it's a, it's a class each month. So we'll have uh, one class, one course each month. It's a Monday through Friday class, two and a half, three hour class. Um, I mean, at, you're, you're getting 10 courses, uh, about 100 bucks a piece each course, which is really cheap. Um, but more than that, you're getting, you're not getting any trash or junk that you would get at a university, if you will. I mean, it's all straight. But it, it, here's open if you want to get a Bible degree. It's also if you want to come to attend these classes, you can audit the classes as well. Um, so we just like to encourage you to come and be a part of these classes as we uh, try to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Okay. Uh, if you have, here's some information. Uh, ask me questions. If you, whatever you need. Any comments or anything before the rest of the place? Brandon, hey, uh, do you think we might be able to get some flyers to take around to these stores and stuff to stick up? Yeah, we'll get you some flyers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, brothers. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to be together as the church. Father, help us to be. Good servants and good Christians, Father, are just faithful servants of yours. Help us, Father, to let the world see that we belong to you. Yeah. Father, just when it comes to the realm of being politically correct, Father, it's okay to be correct, but we have to be correct for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm just reminded of uh, Peter and John in Acts chapter 5 were even threatened and imprisoned. They were brought back in and said, did we not tell you to stop preaching in this name? And their response was, we ought to obey God rather than man. Mm -hmm. And help us, Father, to have the same mentality when it comes to telling others about Jesus, preaching for you, even standing up at times and defending the word of God and righteousness that if it goes against the people, help us just to be servants of yours. Do what you would want us to do. Obey you rather than man. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you'll just bless our fellowship time, bless the food, bless the ones that prepare it for us. We thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for your precious son, Jesus. It's in his sweet name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.